Good morning, my pleasant. Once again, God has blessed us to come together again in another lesson that we're able to study. And again, like I always like to say and think that this is another great lesson that we have today. And we'll be looking at a man called Stephen, uh, one of the original seven that were pulled out as what we know as deacons or the origin of deacons in the church. And we want to look at his life as it relates to his faithfulness uh, to God and and the things that God has asked for him to do. So bow with me as we get into, uh, before we get into our lesson in the word of prayer. Eternal God, we thank you once again for this opportunity. We thank you, O Lord, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for your word that continues to lead God, hold, and direct us in every way. Now bless us with understanding, O Lord, as we go forth and give us all that we need in this life to continuously stand for Christ in every way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson's title of the day is Stephen's Arrest and Speech. And our scripture lesson comes from Acts 6, 8 through 7, 2, 8. And we're still studying under the theme for this quarter, A Living Faith, and for a subtitle for the month of October, Who Understands Faith? And I think that's a real good question uh, to ask, who understands faith? And I think there's not many uh, more appropriate person than Stephen to kind of really bring this idea out about who understands faith. So as we studied back about two or three weeks ago from the book of Hebrews, uh, we came out the 11th chapter and it talked, and we, when we look at 11, one, and a lot of people say is that uh, Hebrews 11, one is the definition of faith. Some say it's a description of faith, but I like, I like to look at this uh, description as to what faith is and we can see how it relates to Stephen in his life. And, uh, and how it uh, his life unfolds based upon uh, the statement of faith of what faith is. And this is what I have. Uh, what is faith? True Bible faith is confidence, obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. And we're going to see that uh, there was a heavy situation placed upon Stephen's life. Um, and, and it ultimately led to his death but he still had faith in God and what God had promised him or what he felt that God would be given, that he would be rewarded. And he stood firm on what he believed, even though it cost him his life. So his confidence in God's word, in spite of circumstances and consequences, we see that so well in the life of Stephen as we unfold the scriptures and look at it. So let's, uh, let's, uh, Let's look at let's look at our lesson today, and let's get into our lesson as we um, as we uh, talk about this man who understands faith. Our lesson starts off at, at verse verse eight of chapter six, but I want to go back and read starting from verse one. It kind of gives us an understanding and, and it probably introduces us a little bit to who Stephen is, uh, so we can kind of understand that. So we're gonna read uh, Acts chapter six starting at verse one. It says, and in those days, when the number of disciples uh, were multiplied, there arose murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in a daily administration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brother, look you out among you seven men of good report, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continuously to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Parcerus, and Nicholas, and Timon, and Prominus, and Nicholas, Nicholas, a parson like of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed and laid their hands on them, uh, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multitude, I mean multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to faith. So this is where we get introduced to Brother Stephen in, in the uh, New Testament. It's when he was one of those who was selected uh, to help the apostles in the daily ministrations of the widows because, again, like I said, the, the Grecian widows felt like they was being neglected or not paid as much attention to or got as much as the Hebrew-speaking Jews. 
So therefore, uh, the apostles say, okay, the, the, the obvious thing to do is we need to get somebody else to help take care of this business because we have an important job of teaching and preaching that we cannot leave. And interesting enough, we see that they they did get uh, seven uh, Greek-speaking uh, Jews, and Stephen was one of them. So, and, and, and I'm glad that point comes out because we're going to see how people like Stephen and Philip started out the same way and, 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 and was doing the same thing. But we'll see in our lives that sometimes God, as we get into this life and we sign on for Christian, uh, for on this Christian band, that God assigns different things to our life as opposed to others. Stephen's went in one direction, and if we follow the Bible down and follow the book of Acts, we'll see that Phillips went in another direction. But let's get into our lesson and we'll see. So we see now that the, 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 the background has been set. We know Philip, I mean, Stephen was one of those seven men that were pulled out to help the apostles in the daily administration of, of the church. Verse 8, let's look at verse 8. And it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. That's verse 8 of chapter 6. First of all, note what we know about Stephen. First of all, let's go back and look at Acts 6. First of all, in Acts 6, it says that what? Acts 6 and 3, excuse me, uh, that he was full of the Holy Ghost, uh, was of a good report, and of wisdom. So those are at least three things that we know about by Stephen. Okay? But looking at Acts 6 and 8, as we open up in our, in our lesson, it also, interestingly, Stephen was full or controlled by five factors. First of all, the spirit, wisdom, faith, grace, and power. So we see that Stephen was a very well-equipped man. Even though he was not an apostle, he still was what we call a deacon or lay help into the church. Uh, Stephen was sti still very well qualified uh, to do the work of ministry of a deacon and the work of the things that the church needed at that particular time. So we see that he was a very well qualified. So he has good qualifications coming in. But then also look what God gave to him as a response or as a result of him coming into the faith. He was able to do what great wonders and miracles among the people. He did great wonders and miraculous signs like Jesus and the apostles. These evidence of God's grace were in addition to his responsibility uh, to the daily administration with the widows. Uh, which was an outstanding, what which what was an outstanding leader? God gave the power to Stephen. Also, this was part of His plan to use Stephen to bear witness unto the leaders of Israel. Stephen's powerful testimony would be the climax of the church witness to the Jews. Then the message will go out to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles. And this is what we're talking about, assignments, or uh, things that God gives in certain people's lives that he does not give to all people's lives. It was Stephen's assignment or his responsibility to do witness for Christ. Because as, as, as we look at the Bible, God, Christ gave the Great Commission or gave the, uh, the um, apostles uh, the understanding that they need to take the gospel and go out to all parts of the world. But what were they doing? They were staying right there in Jerusalem and they were just comfortable there and they were just uh, spreading the gospel there. But that was not where God intended, how God intended for that to be. So what did God have to do? God had to do something now to get these people to get up and start moving out and start carrying the gospel to other places all over the known world at that particular time. And his instrument that he used was Stephen. Again, like I say, our assignments that God give us sometimes seem rough and harsh and very cruel, but it is what God uses to get his plan up and going. And we see that even in the life of Christ. Uh, Stephen went through no more than what Christ did. And that's what we always have to go back and look at. The example set before us was Christ. Jesus suffered and died for us that we may have the right to the tree of life. So looking at Stephen and looking at Philip, we can see that, that God gave them, even though they started out the same way and at the same time was picked for the same reason, 
the assignment that God gave to Stephen in his life was totally different from that which he gave Philip because Stephen's assignment was to come in, to do what he had to do, but also be a witness and eventually martyr or kill in his faith for what he believed and stood for. But it accomplished God's goal by causing the disciples of in Jerusalem to spread out and start to go to the uttermost parts of the world because they was afraid of persecution. So they had to get out and run. So this is how God accomplished, but he used Stephen and Stephen's assignment was to get that accomplished. Philip's assignment was to still continue to go around and, and preach and teach and, and tell people about the word of God. So he had a different assignment. And this is what God helped me to understand as I look at this lesson, that we all have different things. So we cannot look at one person's life and try to compare it to another per to our lives or other people's lives because, because God has different things for different pe people. Or everybody can't be a leader. Sometimes you have to be a follower or those people who come behind and carry on what the initial leader started. And we see that this is what's happened in with, with uh, Stephen. So Stephen was the way or the instrument that God used to really further uh, the, the spread of the gospel because the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people being saved were not going out as he had instructed them to do. So we all have different assignments when it comes to our Christian faith that God gives to us. But we all will receive that crown of life if we stay faithful. So we see that, that, that Stephen was able to do a lot of miraculous and powerful things, just like the apostle. And those things were, were so simply because of the fact they had to understand that what the apostles were saying and the message of Jesus Christ was real. And those signs and wonders that they did were confirmation from God that they were working on behalf of God and not themselves. So, so, so he was able to do those things just as the apostles. Verse 9, it says, There arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Liberty, Liberties, and the Serenians and the Alexandrians, uh, and them of the Cilicia, and of Asia disputing with Stephen. Now, let's see what happens now. Stephen is full of the Holy Ghost, and we're going to see what happens to Stephen as he stands and witness for Christ and do the things that he does. The synagogue of the Libertines, or the freed men, were composed of Jews who have been in captivity in other lands, but were now back in the promised land. Perhaps not all of them had been slaves. However, as Jews from other countries, they could not speak the Aramaic uh, that the inhabitants of Israel, Israel could. And so they worship in a synagogue in Jerusalem, separate from the temple. Although they came from many different countries, they all spoke Greek, the language spoke by the educated people of the Roman Empire. Some of them came from Serene and Alexandria, two of the most prominent cities uh, in North Africa. And some came from Cilicia and Asia, two other prominent providences in the Roman Empire. Saul of Tarsus probably belonged to this synagogue because Tarsus was in Cilicia. So we see that uh, we, God now has, has, has blessed the Jews to come back, educated, get free, come back. But the interesting thing now uh, that has happened, now there, is what, like verse 9 said, there arose certain of the synagogue. Uh, which is called the Synagogue of Libertines uh, and the Serene, and they began to dispute with, with Stephen because uh, no doubt they felt like they were educated, they felt like they were well-versed, and they felt like that, uh, that they were, were able and capable of understanding what the scriptures were. But they didn't realize who Stephen was because he, again, like I say, he's a man full of the Holy Ghost, he's full of wisdom, and he had a good report. So God I mean God was with him too. And so it helps me to understand that too that as as believers, we should never try to look down on another believer, whether we feel like they have the education or the sense or the or, or, or the knowledge, because we have to understand the same Holy Spirit that's working in us would also work in them. And so therefore we ought to be able to to bring our spirits together in truth and righteousness rather than trying to we dispute and cut down uh, each other. So we have to learn to understand that.
So anyway, but like I say, these were these were Jews that uh, that were well educated in the scriptures. But now we must understand that the, not only the Jewish law, but now we're going past the Jewish law into Christianity. And, and they disputed with Stephen with these things like that, because we're going to see how uh, and the accusations that they bring to him in just a few, a few minutes uh, about what they're saying about Stephen. But but we have to understand that sometimes uh, God gives all of us uh, things that he might not give to me or to others, but we have to learn to understand it and like they say, try the spirit by the spirit to see if that's what is of God. Verse 9, verse 10, and it says, and they were not able to resist uh, the wisdom uh, and the spirit by which he spake. And this is interesting, okay, because they're trying to figure out what is this man talking about because he has a new gospel now. They were versed in the Old Testament. They understood what Moses said and all the things there, but now he's coming with a new doctrine or a new understanding. So now they're disputing and debating with him about the things that uh, he's saying. But the thing about it is, uh, look, and we're going to read verse 10 in the New Living Translation. It says, none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit for which uh, Stephen spoke. So so apparently, whatever he was saying, it, it was truth or there was some, 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 some foundation to it because they couldn't resist or they couldn't deny or they couldn't uh, uh, shoot down what, what Stephen was saying. But they disputed heaven with them because they still basically heeded to the Mosaic law. But he's living, he's trying to now help them understand the, the transition from the law to grace. And this is what sometimes we have to understand that sometimes people do have a better or, or more understanding about things that we do. And we need to learn to listen with the open ear rather than just condemn them only because, simply because they either don't look like us, talk like us, come from us, or have something different. Find out what it is. It might be a better way and it might be something that we can do to change our lives and make it for the better. But rather than doing that, they would rather dispute and argue with Stephen over what he was saying. No, although the men of the freedmen synagogues were well educated in the Greek translation of the scripture, they did not expect it would be so difficult to debate with Stephen, simply because why they thought they knew a whole lot more than what they did. That, and, and as Amphor says, look what Jesus said to us in his word. And let's go back to Luke 21 and 15. And we're going to see what Jesus said to disciples when it comes time to, for debate and when it comes time to go up against people. Verse 21 and 15 of Luke says, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all of your adversaries shall not be able to, uh, to gainsay or to resist. In other words, Christ said, I'm going to give you what you need. And that's why it's so important for us to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because when we get into those situations and if we study the word of God and we pray and we're a part of, if God is a part of our lives, then God would give us what we need when we need it. And we see that in, in the example of Stephen. Stephen just presented the gospel. And because they could not accept it or see it, they thought that, again, he was basically counted now as somebody that was a troublemaker or somebody that that uh, 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 was against things. We'll see this a little bit later on as we come up. So Stephen now uh, uh -huh. is in a position where uh, they are after him because they, they, they're baiting, they're trying to dispute him, they're trying to bring him down. But if you speak with the wisdom of God and the God gives you that which you need, then nobody can break it down. Look at Jesus and his conversation with the Pharisees. No matter what they tried to come at Jesus with, Jesus was always able to bring them down or to turn them down simply because of his response and the wisdom that he had and this following of the spirit. And that's all we have to do is allow the spirit to lead us and to guide us in all that we do. And then look what he says in verse verse, uh, verse 11. <clears throat> so now this is what happened when people can't have their way. Uh, this is what happened when uh, people see you as a threat and, and they know that they need to do something because you threaten their very existence or what they believe in. Look at verse 11. It says, And they said, Bored men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Now let's read verse 11 in the New Living Translation. Uh, so they persuaded men, this is verse 11, to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. 
So now this is what they did. Rather than trying to learn and understand what Stephen was trying to say, uh, now they say, okay, basically like Jesus, we got to get rid of him. We got to do something to stop this man here, you know, because he's doing things because they didn't understand. They didn't want to accept how God had moved and how things have changed from, from the law to grace now. So now, uh, now they they go back and get false witnesses and they, and they, and they persuade men to lie on Stephen and even said that he was blaspheming God. So again, the word subord in verse 11 means to persuade or the bride. Blasphemy, because this is their accusation. He speaks blasphemous words. Blasphemous, blasphemous means a disrespectful attitude expressed in an act directed toward God's character. So they said he's disrespecting God. He's not following the scripture. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. He's talking about this Jesus, whatever they're saying. So this is what they're saying. No, their treatment of Stephen uh, parallels the way the Jewish leaders treated Jesus. First, they hired false witnesses to testify against him. Then they stirred up the people who accused him of attacking uh, the law of Moses and the temple. Finally, after listening to all the, his witnesses, they executed him. This is Jesus. We see this back in Matthew 26, 59 through 62. The Jews were jealous over their law and could not understand how Christ had come to fulfill the law and to bring in the new age. They were proud of their temple and refused to believe that God were permitted to be destroyed. Stephen's face the same spiritual blindness that Jeremiah faced in his ministry. See that in Jeremiah chapter 7. The church faced the opposition of the Jews, uh, opposition of the Jewish tradition for many years to come from within its own ranks. And we see that in Acts, uh, Acts 15 chapter and from false teachers concerning, uh, false teachers coming in from the outside. And we see that in Galatians 2. So the church was attacked from both sides, from inside and out, from the Jewish leaders and from false teachers from outside. But, but like I say, they could not understand this new gospel, uh, this new way that Stephen was preaching. So therefore, in their mind, Stephen was blaspheming the word of God and the law of Moses. He was just doing this great wrong. He was just creating this bad situation. And they just had to get rid of him because, again, Jews were very passionate about the, the law, about the temple, about God, and all those things like that. But they could, he, they could not understand that Stephen um, was a man of faith and a man of God and was doing what God said. And this is what I say. We have to understand faith is, like we say, let's go back to the beginning. Faith, what is faith? True Bible faith is confidence, obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. So we see right now the consequences of what Stephen had to face based upon his faith in God. But guess what? Stephen still stood tall and Stephen still went on with what he had to do because we have to be able to follow God rather than man. Look at verse uh, 12 and look what they did. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came unto him and caught him and brought him to the council. Because the religious leaders could not logically tear apart Stephen's defense, and this is the thing of the gospel, they resorted to working up the crowd with issues sure to upset the Jews of Jerusalem. These words were sufficient to arouse the lay people and the leaders to apprehend Stephen and accuse him before the Sanhedrin. This is the third or four times in Acts when the Lord's followers stood before the Jewish court. The others were Peter and John in Acts 4 and 15, Peter and the apostles in Acts 5 and 27, and Paul in Acts 22 and 30. So what, what is the logical thing for people to do when they disagree with you or when they find that, that you know more than they do, uh, they can't um, tear down what you're doing? What's the logical thing to do? Get rid of you. I mean, in any setting, in any, I don't care, in any walk of life, and sadly say sometime even in the church, when somebody speaks up or speaks out about something, what's the obvious thing to do? Get rid of them. Because they're threatening now what we have and what we want to do. So therefore, let's get rid of that person. Let's silence them. Let's put them out. Let's, let's do what we have to do. Or is they going to disrupt what we have going on here? And in their opinion, um, 
uh, Stephen was blasting the, the scripture uh, and Moses and the things that he was doing. So, so they were, they were uh, trying to get rid of Stephen simply because of their own ignorance and their own spiritual blindness. Okay, let's look at verse thirteen and fourteen. We're gonna see what else happened. Okay, they they brought him before the council. Now this is let's look at the next step. And they set up false witnesses, which said, "This man ceased not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place, the te temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, the temple, and shall change the customs which Moses had Moses delivered to us." Now look what happened again. You can't deny. So what do you do? You create a false situation. And that's what happens. And like I said, nine times out of ten, when a person is righteous and standing for truth, the accusations against them is not totally uh, brought in a legitimate way. It's always something bogus around what they're doing, simply to try to strengthen the case of those who are bringing it. So they got false witnesses. So this is the next step, which is false witnesses. The false witnesses were not necessarily outright liars. Listen to what I'm saying. Stephen had probably said the things they accused him of, of how they misrepresented the intentions and, imp and imports of his statements. Uh, we see that in Matthew 26 and 61, where Jesus went through the same thing. The Lord himself predicted the destruction of the temple. We see that in Matthew 24, 1 and 2, and Mark uh, 13, 1 and 2. Though the, he never said he would do it. Okay, again. Listen to what it said. Christ said he would destroy the temple, but he didn't say, I mean, the temple would be destroyed. He didn't say he would do it. But on the other half, the allegations against Stephen involved the, te the temporary nature of the Mosaic system. Undoubtedly, he saw the theological implications of justification by faith and the fulfillment of the law in Christ. Furthermore, if the gospel was for the whole world, and we see that in Acts 1 and 8, the law had to be a temporary arrangement, okay? So that's what we have to understand. He was coming and helping them to understand a better way. But rather than understanding a better way, uh, they took portions of what Stephen said, and uh, they used that against him. Now, we are, we are here in, 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 in the state of Georgia uh, in the midst of a lot of campaigns and a lot of different things, and you'll see on uh, many commercial when one opponent or when one um, group is, is, is trying to highlight another person, they always take certain inserts out of what they say. And they try to use that insert against them without really feeling or uh, really fully understanding the whole context of why they said that. But they just take that one insert, but they won't go back or they won't go forward for people to explain the reason why they're saying what they're saying. They just use that one little insert and all say, hey, yeah, I heard him say that. Or I heard her say that. And this is what they did, they did to Stephen, no doubt. Stephen probably said some things in his witness to them uh, that they tried to use against him or they did use against him in order to say that he's blasphemous and he's going against Moses, he's going against God, he's going to destroy the temple and, and everything. They, they, just, they just were just so dead set on trying to find something that they focus in that one little statement that sometimes we do. Sometimes we can't see or hear anything else anybody says but focusing on that one thing that they said or that one thing that they did and we can't get anything else out of our head but but not really understanding and, and realizing that what they did was in response to something else but we think, oh yeah but you said so and so but the point of it is was it the truth was it right and like i said and instead of investigating what stephen said they would rather bring what false witnesses. And that's the sad part about it. If you're going to try to stand for it, call yourself being a righteous person and cleaning up things, why do you have to go get false witnesses? Or why do you, can't you bring the truth towards somebody if you're going to have an uh, accusation against them? At least, at least be, let it be truthful. Let it be the full picture. Don't just put inserts. Give the full picture of why you're doing that and, and, and make sure uh, that things are in order when you do that. But they didn't do that with, uh, we see here with Stephen. So uh, verse 14 said, we heard him say, 
that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, which is temple, and shall change the customs which Moses has delivered unto us. So these were their accusations based upon what they heard Stephen say, no doubt taken out of context, which most times is that's what happened. Verse 15, and it says, All that sat in the council, looking steadfast on him, saw his face, and had been what? The face of an angel. Stephen's face was shining, similar to Moses' face when he came down from Mount Sinai after receiving the law. In Stephen's case, um, he demonstrated through his words and his ministry that the law was fulfilled in Jesus. The apostles had not yet understood that although they were attending the temple as observant Jews, this had been superseded by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. There was no more need for, to sacrifice the lives of animals to pay for their sins. Although the Ten Commandments, which is God's moral law for all human beings, is still in effect, all the rituals of the Old Testament have been fulfilled by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We still need to study the entire Bible, but these parts have significantly prim, uh, has significant has significance primarily to demonstrate the meaning of the cross. So, so going back to the Old Testament, there was reason for all those things, but it still pointed toward Christ and the cross, and that's what everybody has to understand. It was just not something that was supposed to be here and stay here always. It was something only temporarily that was supposed to happen. But these Jews, because of their, their commitment to the law and to Moses, they could not understand that. And like so many times we've seen in Jesus' case with the Pharisees, some people are just so spiritually blind and ignorant that they can't see the truth and many times don't want to see the truth and they're going to follow what they want to follow to keep what they want to do going on. But let's close this thing out. And it says, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he spoke, verse 2, and he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. So now this is where we'll pick up next week into Stephen's speech as to what he said to the Sanhedrin council. Uh, but, but the thing about it is, is that this, I do believe that, that, that Stephen was one of those who understood faith. And he understood the circumstances and the consequences that would follow by being obedient to God. But yet he still was obedient to what God had said and what God wanted. And again, as we say, we must always understand once we sign on to this Christian band, God assigns us different assignments in life. And, and like Stephen, he was going to be short lived uh, because he would eventually be, be killed. And, uh, but his counterpart, his, 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 his person that came in with him, Philip, uh, he was able to go on and minister and do other things for a long period of time. So we have to understand whatever assignment God gives us once we come on to this journey, that's what we have, and we have to fulfill it. And even though it may not be the most uh, luxurious thing to happen, we still must do because God's plan must go forth. And for the gospel to spread, it was necessary for Stephen to go through this and even lose his life. Hopefully something has been said today that will help you and strengthen you, as I always like to say, because this is a good lesson. It shows how a man of faith uh, can do what God says, still cause great consequences, but in the end, he gets great reward. And that's what's in it for all of us. So until we have the blessed time to meet again, if it be God's will, God bless you, God keep you, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680, or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.